Okay, context switch, we're now changing to public key cryptography. Um, I've already shown you in the video on public key and symmetric cryptology what the general data flow is and what the differences are between how Els and Bob communicate and what keys they have in public key and symmetric key cryptography. Now, we also still need the formal treatment of the systems. So what we'll be looking at in public key cryptography is encryption and signatures. Now, each of those consists of three algorithms. So both of those have a key generation step to generate a public key and private key pair. So that is what Alice has as, well, her key pair. And then she publishes the public key and she keeps the private key private. And then the encryption algorithm is when anybody, say Bob, wants to send a message to Alice, they look up Alice's public key and use a message in this public key to produce a ciphertext using the encryption algorithm. And then only Alice, so only the owner of the private key, can use the private key and the ciphertext and produce a cipher uh, plain text. So the decryption algorithm is a private operation and the encryption algorithm is a public operation. Anybody can encrypt, only the owner of the private key can decrypt. Now for signatures, we also have a, a key pair. This can be a totally different type of keys, so there's no relationship between those per se. It's just both of those are parts of public key cryptography, so you have these key pairs. And then the signing operation requires the private key and the message and outputs a signature. And that's the thing that only the person can do who has the private key. And then verification is something that everybody should be able to do. So that's the big difference between signatures and max. So Macs belong to symmetric key cryptography. And so in a Mac, you do achieve integrity and authenticity, but only for the two parties who communicate. So only Alice and Bob who know the shared key can uh, convince each other that the message hasn't been tampered with and really comes from the other party, but it's nothing you can take to a third party to a judge or something. So Macs cannot be used for contract signing, but for signatures, you can actually convince other people. So anybody can verify. It's not, at least not in this general case, that only a single person is meant to be the recipient. So, of course, you're sending, Alice is sending the message to Bob. So Bob is the main person who wants to verify the signature. But Bob can take the signature to anybody else and say, hey, look, Alice signed this. And so um, there are big differences in how they work and what the data flow is but both signatures and backs ensure authenticity and integrity. So if anybody tampers with the message, then the signature will not be valid or the Mac will not be valid. Let's start with public key encryption and let's go back to the, the history. So the first public key encryption system is RSA due to Rivest, Shamir and Eidelman. Um, I'm highlighting here in red that this is schoolbook RSA. So this is nothing you should be using in practice. I'll spend another lecture on, well, or two or three, on showing how bad it is to use Schoolbook RSA. So there are lots of problems with it. However, we still need to understand Schoolbook RSA first in order to understand how the pieces fit together and also if you can break the underlying math problem in Schoolbook RSA, then you can also break the real RSA. However, if you kind of fudge in together some pieces and observe some relations in Schoolbook RSA, those are hopefully taken care of when RSA gets used in practice. At least if everybody passes this course, then I'm confident it's not going to happen again. Okay, so I said there are three algorithms, key generation, encryption and decryption. So let's look at key generation first. So in key generation, we start by picking two primes. They should be different. And we're computing their product. So n is going to be p times q. And there's also a Euler phi function or Euler totient function running around. If you don't recall what this is, I have it on the next slide. Um, in short, you can just compute this as p minus 1 times q minus 1. And then the next step, you pick some e, some exponent, which is co prime with phi of n. So pretty much any number, well, 2 won't work because p and q are odd primes. So p minus 1 and q minus 1 are even numbers. So any even E will not work. 
and then you can maybe pick three at least with a one third chance you won't have um, with the one third chance you'll have three being a divisor so with two third chance it will be fine and so on so for every e there's going to be lots of i mean for every five of n there's going to be lots of choices of e and then you compute the inverse of e modulo phi of n now that works because e and phi of n are co-prime and for seeing the details you should go back and watch the visit the video on the extended euclid algorithm now that you have computed all of these pieces we're done we have the public key which is n comma e so that's just the product of the primes and this exponent we pick and the private key is n comma d where d is the inverse of e modulo phi of n now the encryption operation should be using just the public key so just n and e and some message in rsa our messages are integers between zero and strict less than n the upper bound is to ensure that the messages are unique because we're going to compute everything modulo n and if you encounter some message which is larger than n you couldn't distinguish that message from the message mod n and so we're computing in the encryption step a very simple thing we're just taking the message that we have to the power of e which is part of the public key modulo n which is the other part of the public key in order to know how to do this efficiently you should watch the video on exponentiation so the ciphertext is simply m to the e mod n that's it and then the decryption looks very much the same from the data flow we take in the ciphertext we again have the same bounds on the ciphertext and then we're computing now with a private key that has exponent d so we're computing c to the d and that is an m prime now it would be kind of useless if the decryption doesn't return the plain text so we want to ensure that m prime is equal to m so let's see why this works okay now it's complicated so our m prime that was defined as c to the d and then c was defined as m to the e so we're now having m to this product of e times d and then we have to go back to step four in the key generation to see how d and e are related so in step four it says we're computing d as the inverse of e modulo phi of n or when you sort things around that means e times d is common to one mod phi of n and that means e times d is a big integer so that when you divide with remainder modulo phi of n then you're getting the remainder one so there is some multiple k of phi of n so that e times d can be written as one plus k times phi of n okay so let's put this into our equation down here so we're having m to the e times d and i'm replacing e times d by one plus k times phi of n then i sort things so i'm splitting the m to the one off as just m and then the m to the k times phi of n i'm using the normal rule of if you have an exponent which is a product you can do this as the first part to the power of the second part and then Fermat's little theorem says that m to the phi of n is equal to one or it's congruent to one mod n so we're just looking at m times one which is m so yes indeed m prime is the same as m modulo n so our decryption does return the plain text so the decryption undoes the encryption operation now i've been using a bunch of math things which i do expect you have seen but let me just repeat them here so that you a have uh, them short at hand and also that you can go and look them up so fermat's little theorem says that you have some integer a which is co-prime to n then a to the phi of n is common to one modulo n and so phi of n is this Euler's totient function um, the general definition is if you have n being a product or part of prime powers so each of these pi's is a prime they're all different so pi is not equal to pj or i not equal to j and then we have exponents which are at least one so if you take your n and write the prime factorization say you have 15 you write it three times five or you have 25 you're writing it as five squared 
And then here is the rule of how you compute the pi function. Um, depending on which situation, one of these two might be more convenient to compute. Both of them compute the very same number. You can see this by taking the definition of n into there, and then you expand n, and aha, uh -huh, okay, you're just dividing out by pi in the second argument, and so that's p to the ei minus p to the ei minus 1. So in our case of RSA, we have two primes which are different. Then we're getting just p minus 1 and q minus 1. So the exponent is 1 in each case, so exponent minus 1 is 1. And so that's the result. So it matches what we've been using in the RSA function. And so yes, we do have that any message to the phi of n gives us 1. Now I've been a little bit cheating there because in, in Fermat's little theorem I've been saying I do require that a and n are co-prime, whereas in the RSA system I didn't exclude m's, which were not co-prime. Now you could say, well, no, um, if you would find something where the GCD is not equal to 1, well, then the GCD is either p or q, because you're looking at a number between 0 and n, and so then you have found one of the factors, and if you know one of the factors, well, if you know p, you can compute q, and then you compute phi of n, and you can compute d. So if you would be hitting this by accident, that's as likely as breaking the system to begin with. And that shouldn't happen. But furthermore, we can actually prove that also for non-coprime m, we get that the relation that we actually are using, namely that the m to the 1 plus a multiple of the Euler phi function of n, Gets us, is congruent to m modulo n. So that holds in any case. So we don't even need to worry about somebody um, accidentally getting a mistake. We should worry much more um, that this person has broken the system at that point or knows Alice's public key, uh, private key. And then the last thing that I have on the slide is uh, a generalization of Fermat's little theorem du de Lagrange, which says if you have a finite group, and well, up there we're actually looking at the integers modulo n, and then we're looking at the multi multiplicative group in there, so we're taking a times a times a and so on, so that means we're working with the group operation modification. Um, and then Lagrange says for any group element a, we're getting that a to the order of the group to the number of elements in the group is equal to 1, where this 1 means the neutral element of the group. So up in Fermat's little theorem, I'm looking at the integers modulo n and then taking the multiplicative group. So that means I'm looking at 1 being the neutral element because 1 times anything stays anything. So a times 1 is a. And the number of elements that are in the multiplicative group are exactly the number of elements that are co-prime to n. And that's the definition of the Euler-Totian function. So or the Fermat's theorem is just a special case of, of Lagrange's theorem. So if you ever see a finite group running around and you have an element to the power, the order of the group, then you're getting one. Okay, so we've now seen RSA encryption, the schoolwork version. I also promised you signatures. So the RSA signature system, again, warning, this is the schoolwork RSA signature system. Do not use this in practice. So Revis, Chemi, and Edelman actually did RSA encryption and RSA signatures, both in the same paper from 1977. Um, key generation looks exactly the same. It's doing exactly the same operations. And then um, the operation, uh, the signature generation operation, well, that needs to use the private key on something related to the message to produce the signature. Now, in the RSA case, what they're doing is you take the message, which can be arbitrary length, you hash it down to some fixed length. So the obvious purpose of the hash function here is to achieve some length, which is, oops, the, the sign method, the hash of the message has to be in less than n. Actually, the message itself could be larger than n, can be anything, doesn't have to be an integer. You just need to define your hash function to return something which is an integer. And then you compute that thing to the power of d, so that's part of your secret key, modulo n, and that's your signature. And then to verify the signature, 
That's something that anybody can do. So the signature S not C has to be between zero and N. Um, and you take the signature to the power of E. And well, just like in RSA encryption, if you take something to the D and to the E, you should be getting the original back. So this H prime there should be the same as H of N. So if somebody has given you a valid signature, you should be obtaining the same value as H of M. And then you accept that this is a valid signature and else you output that this is a fake signature. So that it works is the same reason that RSA encryption works. And we can sign arbitrary long messages for, for encryption. The typical use case is you just want to send the key for the symmetric, uh, symmetric encryption system at the Mac. So you don't actually care how long the message is allowed to be, but for signatures, those have to be on the real document. And so that's one of the reasons why we want to use a hash function. Another good thing about the hash function is also that it destroys some of the algebraic properties. A downside of the hash function is if somebody would be able to compute collisions of this hash function and ask me to sign some innocent message M, get the signature on that, and has actually found some other m prime which hashes to the same value, then the signature that I gave is also valid for that one. So if you're concerned about the hash function being weak, you should actually randomize the signature somewhat so that there's something before the m that you sign which is not under the control of the person asking you for a signature. And very important, RSA is really unusual in how the kind of verification matches encryption, signing matches decryption. So this is not the general case. So I don't want anybody at any moment to tell me that, oh yeah, signature signing is just the inverse operation of, uh, it's just the matching operation of uh, decryption. That is only for RSA signatures. This is a very unusual case. Um, for instance, in post-quantum cryptography, this is an area that we're currently working on. We have several systems where we only have a signature system, we don't have an encryption system or the other way around. So RSA is not the normal case. So please memorize and uh, don't fall into that trap. Okay, and don't use schoolbook RSA. Stay tuned for why not.